the delusion is real. So I'm sitting on the couch watching YouTube on my iPad, and it's been a long day. I was doing some outside work, and I fell asleep. I fell asleep. Now, what does this have to do with advertising? Well, it turns out that when I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, I think I fell asleep about 9 o'clock, and I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, guess what was still running? My YouTube on my iPad was still cycling through videos. Now, I specifically don't like the autoplay, so I try to turn that off whenever I can because I want to choose the next video. I don't want it to be automatic, and it keeps coming back on to autoplay. Um, But essentially, the whole time I'm laying there sleeping, the YouTube is running up impressions, running up advertisements, running up all kinds of stats that people follow. And we're going to talk about the truth of direct response advertising in today's modern media. I'm Justin Hitt with Ad Briefings Copywriting Tips. Number one impressions, views. I've been saying this for nearly 20 years. I was I was there during the dot com, okay? I was doing dot I was doing IT services. I was selling millions of dollars in services a year. I was working with venture capitalists, startup companies. I understand that you can't just slap a dot com at the end of something and that there is kind of a hype scheme or a hype train that is ran to make people believe things that keeps money flowing towards those who want the money. In the world of internet marketing, certain things have not changed. And these things do not change whether you're using newspaper advertising, postcard advertisement, letters in the mail, fax broadcasts, internet emails, internet landing pages, social media. None of it matters. And this is essential materials that I got from the book, The Elementary Laws of Advertising by Henry S. Bunting. In fact, I bought every copy of that book I could find. Uh, It's from 1918. And it even references that this was a fact before 1918. Uh, If if you get a a copy of the Harper's Weekly Journal from the 1865 during the Civil War, you'll find in the back of it classified ads. They didn't care about circulation. They didn't care about anything other than this one measure that you can use today. So let's get back to my YouTube story. So I'm literally sleeping and I notice it's still running even though I turn off the autoplay. I notice that there's advertisements at the beginning, middle, and end of every video, usually two ads on each. And then on my television, I check the next day. I don't see as many ads because in my network here, I've made every effort to block advertising, every effort to block cookies, because when I'm using this network, I don't want to obscure my stats on my site because I might be testing a landing page. I might be testing a, a thank you page. And I don't want Google Analytics to trigger on things when we're just testing it. We're just getting the page layout correct. So we're on purpose, turn off the Google tags and Google analytics for individuals who are logged into the sites under a under an administrative role or an editorial role. We will also block as much of this as possible with browser uh, blocks and such as, and, and such. However, it turns out that a recent update of the iPhone and the iPad YouTube shows a horrendous number of ads. It's amazing how many ads are shown on these apps. And what they're doing is they're bypassing the local DNS. They're bypassing the local ad blocking or content filtering. And they're driving as many ads as possible. Now, what does this mean to advertisers? This means to advertisers that your ad impression count is inflated. So if you're counting on impressions because you're paying CPM, then you're losing money to old dudes sleeping on the couch or other people who have left something up and running. Now, I don't even leave up and running my own channels because I know that this impacts the ad targeting for the channel. So if I'm watching my own videos, and this is another reason we make a a conscious attempt to block, uh, because I don't see ads on my desktop or my uh, my editing station, Um, the reason we make a conscious attempt to block, because I don't want to find more viewers like me, I want to find viewers like customers. So we build out a customer avatar, and the real measure that matters is the number of customers on my accounting system, not the number of sales on a website. Not, I want money settled in a bank account somewhere. 
And this is the way it's been forever. However, Google pay-per-click, same damn problem. They'll show three ads. They'll show five ads. They'll show ten ads on a page. And so you're paying for impressions or you're having a lower conversion rate because they're just throwing that stuff up on content. On YouTube, on some of these other channels, they hyperinflate the impressions by auto-playing videos. Or, this is even worse, videos will start playing in the background of the browser. Now, this, is, this hasn't happened too many times, but have you ever been in a situation where you're hearing a YouTube video play or you're hearing an advertisement play, but you don't think you have a tab open that is on that particular uh, channel. And so it's another tab that is playing in the background that just happened to come up to the surface and now you hear it playing. Now, they may not be doing this tr- to be tricky. It could have legitimately been a tab that was left behind and you know some keystroke has got it to play again or the page refreshed for some reason. I've noticed the Chrome browser and a couple other browsers, um, the tabs will go to sleep. And when you go to the tab, it refreshes. And so it's not necessarily something they're doing, but these are impressions that you're getting that you are not benefiting from and they are not targeted and they're not an engaged audience. And it it goes back to the time where you would make sure you didn't buy circulation with people who weren't customers. So you may not be aware of this, but back in the day when you'd get a space advertisement in a newspaper or a magazine, you would get a media kit. The media kit would give you an idea of the audience's demographic. There's sometimes they're psychographic. What kind of things have they bought in the past? You get the same information when you rent a mailing list. And a, a smart marketer, even just 10 to 15 years ago, would not do a placement or run an advertisement on a list that wasn't as high as possible uh, composition of that target buyer so again we build out the customer avatar we look for lists and media kits and we do this as a service for hundreds of clients where we'll actually do a research on a particular audience so one of the the audiences that we research we have to refresh these things every couple of years because channels change magazines go out of business websites go out of business but we built a a targeted program for sales managers so we wanted to know if they're using salesforce.com or or HubSpot or some other product. All three of those all those platforms have media channels that sell advertising. We also want to know if they're in reading any certain magazines. And we build out this profile because we don't want to spend money on channels that don't reach our buyers. Now, this is important because when you give money to an ad agency, an ad agency is going to just spend the money. Okay, because they can always come up, they have better excuses for not getting results than they have knowledge about getting results. And that's the thing we do differently for the type of agency that I help you set up. It isn't about impressions. It isn't about exposure. It isn't about the number of likes. It's about the number of sales you produce to recover the money you've invested in reaching customers. Because think about it this way. You've got a product or service that is highly valuable to a specific customer. And the faster you can reach that customer and the more uh, you can connect with that customer at a, at a reasonable rate, the better the customer is going to benefit. See, you're not some big dumb company that has a million dollar budget and they got to spend that budget or they lose it. You're not a big dumb company who doesn't really care because they're building brand. You're a a marketer, direct response marketer, who's using words that sell, and the relevance of those words must match the audience, and then the results you get, again, the very best copy to the wrong audience gets poor results. Because we're using a decision methodology to determine what copy goes to what audience on what medium, Dan Kennedy's uh, you know triangle of message to market match, is that we are focusing on investing our money in buying valuable customers. Now, we don't just want the customer for one transaction. We want them for month after month, year after year to build a lifetime value of the customer. But you have to understand that these channels, these advertising networks, these folks who are teaching you how to measure marketing results and and telling you to measure keywords. Well, they don't tell you to measure keywords. They tell you you have to get the really good keywords so you get organic traffic, which is free. Well, what if you could just put an ad 
in front of buyers for for what it is you have to offer, and then for every penny that you're spending on ad, you're reaching the highest density of qualified buyers. So, for example, if you're selling knives for outdoorsmen, you could just advertise on Google to people under a certain demographic, a certain keyword, but you could also just put an ad in Backwoods Magazine. Backwoods Magazine actually has a, an advertiser that's been ongoing for years that sells restored knives. And so if you have a knife that fits in that category, you could offer someone a new knife. Or again, there's other opportunities here, uh, but th- that audience is already proven. If you're showing your ad on a YouTube channel that's talking about uh, everyday carry kits or the right backpacking gear. And by the way, I, I do have a profile on that audience of the outdoorsman or the adventure-seeking uh, family uh, that, that, that has camping gear in general um, or in, interested in survival, they want product, yes. But when they're sitting at their TV watching a YouTube video about the latest gear, they can't see the links at the bottom of the description. So I don't, I don't know if you've seen it from time to time. I'll say, hey, there's a link in the description to get more information. Well, if my viewer is on a smart television or on, a, on an iPad and the screen's full, full scale, they're not going to find those links because that interrupts their experience. It's not a medium where they are going to click through. They see the YouTube video on TV as television and they aren't, there's no click to do. But if you include a phone number there, then they'll see it as kind of an infomercial. They'll respond to a phone number. If you offer a free gift, or you ask them to write something down on paper where they can be watching your video on the television and they can pull up their phone or their iPad. Maybe you put a QR code. QR code's a little tricky because not everybody likes to use those or knows how to use them. But ultimately, again, your response mechanism provides a more valuable measure of audience engagement than all of these other factors. It's The heat maps are nice. The uh, engagement factors that come on Facebook or Google they're okay, but ultimately, you know for sure someone is interested in what it is you have to offer when they request additional information, giving you a good email address that you can follow up on, or they buy a product or service. See, we have to shortcut all of these tricks and tips and you know organic versus paid. It's all paid traffic. If you take any time to produce something, it is costing you money so why not put it in front of the highest composition the highest value the most beneficial audience now i've learned this from dave d and dan kennedy and a lot of these marketers that'll they'll market from the platform nothing beats standing up in front of a room and speaking to a live audience now this is a skill set that i have not completely obtained i have written platform presentations that did okay but ultimately if you're going to be on the the TV, whether it's a YouTube video, whether it's a DVD they downloaded, you have to understand platform presentations rather than simply being a curiosity. So the last point I want to make is because I literally slept through hours of videos just going on and on and on, and and, and so these people thought they were they had an audience. They don't have an audience. And they're probably all excited because I watched the entire video. But I didn't really watch the entire video because I was sleeping. So the video format must be more engaging. It must be more interactive. It must ask the viewer to do something. And then it must be in an environment of metrics. And we talk about this in our performance metrics programs. Is that you are measuring behavioral changes. So if I go from a passive viewer to an active viewer, that's more valuable to know than the, the, you know, how long they watched the video or how many impressions the video got. Now, there are negative factor behavioral changes that are important. So when I look at a report, um, so I'm, I'm helping a client optimize their YouTube channel, which we have a program about optimizing your YouTube channel that uses our topic testing method. It's very applicable for any type of media. But when I'm looking at the average view percentage and I see 105%, I don't get excited because I know that video was a short. So perhaps they just let the short loop. 
But when I see four subscribers for the same video, I'm willing to take a chance to test another video on the same topic as a in, in the same format on the same channel because I have a behavioral activity, which means during a short video, they went and subscribed. Now, it's entirely possible that my average view percentage is very high on this particular video because they took the time to subscribe. But So that further reinforces the, the importance that the view percentage isn't that valuable. Um, however, we're going to talk about a caveat here shortly. I do see the four subscribers. Now, there were 34 likes. Is that a behavioral change? Yes and no. Because the two factors, average view percentage and number of likes, does impact YouTube's recommendation for your video. But what it matters to my pipeline or my uh, marketing funnel is the number of subscribers. Because if I do a paid audience match, so I have a paid video or I'm promoting a video that's on a similar topic, I am going to target my subscribers because subscribers are names on a list. Now, I could get hung up and do optimize my channel and, and be all excited about it. And, and if I did, I would be missing the more important factor, which is that every one of these videos is coded with a click-through link. So pretty much in the description of every video, every podcast, I have a small space advertisement that usually says, uh, some benefit about, or it's got a headline benefit or promise about the newsletter, and then it has a kind of a call to action and a link to the newsletter. I code those whenever possible so that I can see which of the videos generate leads on my website. Now, here's the question for you Do your videos that create subscribers also create leads on your website? Well, shockingly, it's not the case. I have long form videos that are an hour. So this is a short I'm talking about here. Got me four subscribers. I have videos that are an hour and a half, or, or even just ninety, or, or just forty minutes, that have a ten percent of the audience remaining at the end of the video. They don't show up on this list for subscribers. They don't have a very high view percentage, yet they're generating leads on my website. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means behaviorally, they got partway through the video. They clicked the link. They went and got the free gift that I offered them in the video. They went and asked the question. They went and joined the newsletter. And then either they went back to the video and finished it, or they stopped watching the video. Because the gift that I gave them was more valuable than the video itself. Do you see how this works? If I'm focusing only on the metrics for YouTube or Bit, bit shoot or odyssey or any of the other channels where my content syndicates or if i'm looking at the stats on a on a uh, podcast and that's on spreaker google Podcasts, apple Podcasts, spotify and probably 15 other channels then i'm going to be so busy looking at stats that don't matter as much ignoring the one stat that matters the most which is the leads generated on my website but then again if i worry about the leads generated on my website i miss the even more important stat of the sales produced from which channel so the the last takeaway here and if this is worth getting out a piece of paper and writing it down get off your damn phone Get off the computer and, and stop being, grab some paper. If you don't have a notepad or some index cards next to you, then you're missing out because here's the factor that matters the most. You need to mind all of these statistics. So folks are not wrong to tell you to look at these other stats, but you have to have a clear lead and sale attribution from the front end of your funnel to the back end of your funnel. So where are the leads coming from? And of those leads, wh who are converting? So you're creating a chain of communications that links together an offer and a response. Every response leads to another offer, and every offer leads to some measurable behavioral change, which is the response, until you get to the point where you have names on your accounting platform, sales and transactions that have settled not stuff stuck in your merchant account, not stuff that could get locked up in PayPal, not stuff that you know promises. We're talking about actual cash over cash, month over month, cash flow in the business, 
And then if the attribution is right, now what does attribution mean? That means the tagging I was talking about. Like I know the external video ID, I know what content ID, the source, and I also know the medium of the content because that same video might do great on YouTube, not so good on BitChute. Something might do horrible on YouTube and great over on Odyssey. Because the source attribution is the same, I can then have that decision tree clearly mapped out in my analytics and ultimately telling me what generates leads and what generates sales. So if someone's sleeping while my video is playing in the background or they're passively listening to a podcast in their car or it's just the, the next video in a series of video they're watching on their TV or smart device, I know what contributes to the customers. See, to me, a customer is more valuable than a lead, is more valuable than impressions. And as Jim Straw would say, 100 buyers on a list is worth well more than 10,000 buyers on a list or 10,000 tire kickers on a list. Do you understand my point? Do you understand the importance of what I'm saying? The measures you're to being told by the mainstream marketing devices, marketing platforms, advertising platforms, even the popular channels of these days are not in your best interest if you don't understand what Henry S. Bunting uh, had taught since 1918 and Harper's Daily Newspaper uh, presented in the 1800s and it will never change is that we must measure the sales and the leads and then understand the behavioral characteristics that add to these two things. When you understand this, you can now write copy for buyers. You can create campaigns that convert. You can ultimately build up a funnel that is working whether or not it's Google this year or, or AltaVista next year or, or artificial intelligence or actual intelligence. Your power is brought back to you. You become a greater asset to your client. You're able to reach your customers and serve them. And you're able to do it with simple mathematics to understand what works and what doesn't. I'm Justin Hit with Ad Briefings Copywriting Tips. If you have a marketing budget of $10,000 or more each month and you like to work on your lead and sales attribution, I can show you how to do this and you can include my fees in your advertising cost and we will still lower the cost per sale, we'll still improve your conversion rate and we'll ultimately boost your cash flow. And the way that we do this, and I've shared these methods with you in the past, you're welcome to do them on your own, but some people would like a little bit of help, um, is the topic testing methods, it's proper lead and sale attribution, it's having your analytics set up correctly, it's understanding how these systems work so that you can feed the, the funnel, make the sales, and ultimately know what works and what doesn't. If this is something you're interested in, I am available from time to time by visiting the website www.adbriefings.co.uk. My clients tend to be English speaking. They tend to be in uh, certain audience and markets, and you can ask me about the markets that I specialize in. Um, the customers all, nearly always tend to be affluent or high net worth individuals. So if you're trying to reach high net worth individuals and you're tired of spending a lot of money up front and getting very little results, I can show you how to optimize it. However, you do need some traffic on your website already. You do need to have an advertising budget. And uh, it, it's kind of one of those things where any metric works if you don't have any money and you're not really trying. It, you have to be serious about creating and keeping profitable, profitable customers and transforming business relationships into profits. And you can do that with words that sell. You can do that with appropriate metrics. And then ultimately, it just starts falling in place. You start making sales, you upsells, cross sells. The customers are satisfied because you're getting the right people buying your products and services. And then ultimately, um, it doesn't matter how much you spend to get a customer. You're going to know the numbers so that you can make a profit, increase customer lifetime value, and ultimately have success in your marketing. Again, I'm Justin Hit with Ad Briefings Copywriting Tips. If you have questions about this or anything I cover, or even just have comments, visit me at www.adbriefings.co.uk. Go to the contact page and ask your question or join us on our newsletter. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next podcast.